So good evening. Welcome. Glad you're all here. This is our second candidates forum for the, uh, this time it's for the county executive race and for the state senator race. These two fora, we had one a couple weeks ago, are sponsored by the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula. It's our job to be advocates for the citizens of the peninsula on matters of conservation, preservation, development, and um, the questions that you're going to hear tonight, both for the candidates for county executive, but also for the candidates for state senator, are going to represent some very local Mayo Edgewater issues, but they're also going to represent some very um, county-wide policy issues. So we try to put together a mix of those questions, and I'm right now screening the cards that you've given us for questions for the county executive. My name is Matt Minahan. I'll be host for this evening's uh, uh, Candidates Forum. Let me explain to you how we're going to do this. I'm going to ask a question, and each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question themselves. And then they'll have two minutes to talk to each other and respond to each other's responses. So we're hoping that there's a conversation uh, among the candidates. And my guidance to them was, you have two minutes to answer your question. Use less if you can, so we can have more of you together, OK? <laughs> Both Mr. Pittman and Mrs. Hare have been strong advocates for the Mayo Peninsula. Uh, Mrs. Hare has been our uh, council person for District 7. And of course, you know, Stewart has been our county executive. So we'll, we'll just begin by asking each of them to give us an opening statement. We'll, uh, that is limited to two minutes. And we'll uh, begin uh, in alphabetical order with Jessica Hare. Good evening. Thank you all for having me here this evening. Thank you to the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula for putting this on. My name is Jessica Hare, and I am running to be your next county executive to bring common sense, proactive, efficient leadership to the county office. Uh, I am a mom. I'm a wife. I'm an engineer. I'm an attorney. I'm a court-appointed special advocate for kids in foster care, and I'm your neighbor. I live just down the street, and actually this is the library I bring my children to every week to pick out their stories. I've been honored to be your county councilwoman for the last four years, and I have focused my time on the council, lowering the tax burden for our hardworking families, uh, creating opportunities for small businesses to thrive in the county, and encouraging the revitalization of aging infrastructure. I've also been very proud to partner with folks and communities on the peninsula for issues that are meaningful to you, to help with tidal flooding issues by putting in check valves in culverts and in individual properties, working on stormwater projects that are not functioning the way they're supposed to, and advocating for uh, the power lines on 214 to be buried so that when we have high wind storms, we're not seeing those power outages. And these are, the, these are the guiding principles that I take with me. I, you'll see a lot in my literature, I talk about cost of living, about crime, about uh, modernizing county government. And at the same time, over the last four years, uh, my opponent has raised your income tax, circumvented the voter-imposed property tax cap, uh, and, and grown the county budget much faster, dramatically faster than personal income growth in the county and outside the guidelines of the Spending Affordability Committee. At the same time, we're seeing a dangerous trend now where our violent crime is on the rise. Gun crime is up 45%. Our police recruitment is at an all-time low. And we actually have homicide detectives doing overtime work as uh, crossing guards right now. Our crisis calls to the warm line have almost doubled. We can do better than this. Um, and I, I speak a lot about bringing proactive leadership to solve the problems that are meaningful to you. And I do want to note brief, briefly, my opponent has recently called me an extremist. Um, so my final note that I'll say, it's a little ironic because I was called a, a rhino in the primary for the last year, but that's another story. Um, I have passed the most bipartisan legislation on the council over the last four years. As the lead sponsor, I've passed more than anybody else. I'm proud of that record of consensus building and logic, and I bring that dedication and that focus to the county executive's office. So I ask for your vote on November 8th and look forward to a conversation this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Pittman. All right. Looks like we're going to get feisty tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, um, you know, as I look around here, uh, some, of the, some of you, the first time I met was when you had organized the Neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula 
because you wanted to fight back against Steve Shue's vision for development on the peninsula. I was on the board of the Anne Arundel County Farm Bureau, and we met because we wanted to prevent the Shue administration from driving a wedge between South County and Mayo and the rest of the county when they did that urban-rural demarcation line. And we made a pledge to each other. We said, we are all going to work together to improve land use and protect the open space of Anne Arundel County. Now, at that time, we all knew that this county had grown drastically, but we had not kept up with the infrastructure. And when I met with the police officers and the firefighters and the teachers, they said, and I think we all knew this, we had not kept up with our services either. And they said, we need to increase the staffing levels and we need to increase the pay so that we stop losing our good people to neighboring counties. So we were able to do that and deliver on that, which is why I've been endorsed, I think, in the last election and this election by the unions of those three groups. Um, but we also did the Permanent Public Improvements Fund so that we could actually address the infrastructure needs. And I want to just note that I, ha I have great pride in the fact that we did that in a fiscally disciplined way. We kept our county taxes, property, and income lower than any county in the region. And we also managed to get that AAA bond rating that this county has tried to get for 50 years. And we did all that and got a bipartisan budget, six to one, at the end of it all and set, us, set ourselves up for future economic challenges. Our county's in better fiscal condition than it's ever been. But the thing I think I'm most proud of is the work that we've done on the environment. We taught this county how to say no to bad development. You saw that at Glebe Heights, you saw that at, at the Enclave at Crofton, you've seen that at the Chesapeake Terrace landfill, you've seen it all over the county. And, and it was because we implemented our laws, we passed the Forest Conservation Bill, and we engaged you, we engaged residents in the process. We've had probably 200 plus town halls in this county, and we set up a system, system in our general development plan, so no upzoning can happen anywhere before that community does a region plan with its stakeholder advisory committee. So I look forward to having a, a thorough discussion about these things tonight and talking about why we need to continue on the path that we're on, that we've been on for the last four years. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me just say we have six or seven chairs right up here in the front, so those of you who are standing, it'll be a long night. So don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on up. This isn't church. Best seats in the house are up front. This isn't church, and there's no collection plate. So. Uh, <laughs> well, there might be. No. Well, that, you, you can do that. We're not. And there's some more over here, too. So uh, three more up front. So if you're standing in the back, please feel free to come up. So uh, just begin. Um, First of all, just tell us what about your personal biography makes you the best candidate for this job? Help us get to know you better. What about your personal biography makes you the best candidate for this job? And I'll, I will alternate who goes first on each of one of these questions. So, because Jessica went first, Stuart? Um, for me, it is having been in business and running organizations for 35 years before taking this job, when you have to do budgets and you have to meet payroll, suddenly everything gets real in life. And, and, uh, and I'm proud of the work that I did. Um, the other thing is that I spent a decade doing something called community organizing. And I did this in uh, Chicago after college. I did it in Des Moines, Iowa. I came back home when I had my daughter and um, moved to this area. And I helped other groups around the country doing community organizing, which is increasing engagement in neighborhoods to empower them. And for me, every issue that I hear about, I think about um, where's the power structure on that issue? How do you make change? And I know that when you all were organizing, uh, we were both working with Jerry Walker, our council person, um, both Farm Bureau and the neighbors of the Mayo Peninsula. And we were strategizing about how to engage people to turn the levers of power to get that administration to stop thinking about the parks in this area like they should be Disneyland and protect it for the community. And so um, empowering people is what I've done most of my life and running businesses. And I think that's what sets me up. That's what makes me good at this job. Thank you very much. I'm going to tell two quick stories. Uh, my mom put herself through medical school by joining the military, so I was born on an Air Force base. And when I was really little, she worked multiple jobs to give her life, her give her kids an easier life than she had. And childcare was expensive, so many nights that meant kids went to work with mom. And when I was about six, she would come to kindergarten and pick me up and pick my little sister up, and she would take us to the night clinic where she worked long into the evening seeing patients. She brought two things with her. 
She brought crayons and sleeping bags. And she would park us in an exam room. And you know that crinkly paper that makes a terrible noise when you sit on it at the doctor's office? It makes a phenomenal coloring book. And as long as we didn't fight, we were allowed to color for as long as we wanted. And when we got tired, we'd roll out the sleeping bags and we'd fall asleep. She did this every week until she had saved up enough money to open her own medical practice. And she taught me a lesson in that. Hard work leads to limitless opportunities. It's one of the things that makes this country such an amazing place to grow up and to live. And it's something I try and teach my young girls now with my husband. Story number two, which would be my second lesson, would be college, where I studied civil engineering. And at first glance, you don't think that has much to do with, with public service or politics, but what touches every community? It's your infrastructure, right? It's your roads, it's your bridges, it's your sanitary sewer, it's your stormwater issues, it's your electricity, it's your sidewalks, it's your schools. It's all infrastructure. Local government is quite literally where the rubber meets the road. And what is engineering but problem solving? You take an issue, you take a set of constraints, and you work at it until you find a common sense, innovative, efficient solution. Those are the qualities that I bring to the county executive's office, and uh, combined with my, my volunteer work and my law degree, I think set me up quite uniquely to solve these challenges that we all face together. Thank you. Thanks very much. So um, you're both uh, incumbents in your jobs now for the last four years, different jobs, but both incumbents. Um, what do you consider your major accomplishments in your current term, and what did you not accomplish that you tried to get done? I'm going to ask you later what you hope to do in your next term. So this is only, what did you get done and what didn't you get done that you wished you had? Thank you very much. Uh, two bills stand out to me that I'm most proud of. One uh, was passed earlier in my term and one actually was just this year, this summer. This summer, I passed a bill uh, on nurseries. There are a number of small business nurseries in our county um, that were really struggling because the Office of Planning and Zoning was taking a very strict re reading of the county code and telling them that it was illegal to grow plants in containers on the nursery. They had to grow them in the ground. And there were actually several nurseries who were being sued by the county for injunctive relief. And so I went to visit some of these nurseries and I said, well, gosh, this code is wildly outdated. Obviously, it's okay to grow plants in containers, especially if they're not native, you're growing these flowers, things like that. So I went ahead and worked with uh, Office of Planning and Zoning and the folks at, at issue and put together a bill to modernize the county code to account for how nurseries currently do their business. The part I'm most proud of is that not only did I get unanimous co-sponsorship, I'm sorry, unanimous support on this bill, I got unanimous co-sponsorship from the entire council. So that goes back to my building consensus and kind of common sense legislation. Go back a couple of years, the other bill that I was uh, very proud of was actually raising the ceiling on our savings account in the county. And that's super helpful because it helps prevent uh, future tax increases when we have a revenue miss. And it's actually one of the major reasons that the bonding companies cited for raising our bond rating in the county when they did that. I was the lead sponsor on this bill. And once again, not only did I get unanimous support from my colleagues, I got unanimous co-sponsorship. I'm the only person on the county council who's been able to do that these two times, and I'm super proud of that. Um, something I didn't get done that I wish I could have gotten done, I put a bill in that would have helped our uh, local public safety officers by allowing um, independent uh, apartment complexes or landlords to offer discounts to our public safety officers. Uh, at first, it seemed like it was going to get support. Unfortunately, it ended up failing on party line votes. It was disappointed because it, it really was just kind of giving the option to these companies to be able to say, hey, I, you know, much like people can give a discount to a military if they want to do that, we're going to give a discount if you're a police officer or you're a firefighter, you're a detention officer. Uh, that's something I'd definitely like to see come back. I was sad it didn't pass. Um. Actually, since we're being pretty loose on things, I'm going to go ahead and respond to a couple of the, the bills that you talked about, and you can respond to the stuff that I say as well, because um, I want to talk about our accomplishments as well. But, you know, the way we manage the county council when you're the administration is very important, because you want to make sure it's functional, it gets things done, and that was part of the problem in the last administration, is that it was very hard to get a majority on just about anything, because a lot of them didn't like each other. I think some of y'all like each other, which is good. And <clears throat> Pete Barron, who works for us, works closely with you. So when, when there's a bill to come forward that we know we want to do, we often encourage and invite a council member to introduce it, because then it doesn't count as one of our bills. Um, we're only allowed three bills per, per, per meeting. Uh, they limit us. 
And so when we knew that we were ready to increase the actual money in the rainy day fund, uh, we knew that we needed legislative authority to do it, to go from five to six. We did it again later from six to seven. Um, but I know that our, our budget officer, Chris Trumbauer, talked to you about that and uh, talked to you about introducing it. And then we got seven co-sponsors for the bill. So everybody co-sponsored that bill. But I'll tell you one thing, that the bond rating agencies do not give you a higher rating because you have le legislative authority to raise your rainy day fund. They actually give you the higher rating because you put money into the fund and you have more money in your rainy day fund. And you have to vote to do that. That's part of the budget. And I will say that my opponent is one of only two people in the history of the county on the county council that's voted no on all four budgets. The other person was Michael Peruca because he said he did not believe in public education. On the nursery bill, <clears throat> that was one where everybody supported it, but we worked together. Our administration was not shutting down nurseries because they were growing pot plants in pots. There were some complaints from neighbors where there were some legitimate issues that needed to be resolved that had to do with storing materials as well. And those materials were, the question was, are they a landscaping company or are they a nursery? Um, we actually took the proposal that Councilwoman Hare, a good proposal, and then we expanded it and made it broader so that it was better for the nurseries and then everybody supported it. The stuff that I'm <clears throat> really proud of having done is uh, I mentioned the AAA bond rating, but I'll say it again because fiscal discipline to me is so important in setting ourselves up for the future. But another one was the Forest Conservation Bill, and that was a really hard bill to pass, and we only got it through 7-0 because so many of you mobilized and so many organizations mobilized. But the bill that we proposed was stronger than the bill that passed. There were lots and lots of amendments, and the one that was most damaging was the grandfathering clause. Um, we have lost a lot of forest because of that grandfathering clause. We could only get two votes on the council to support the original bill and to support not having a grandfathering clause. The other five council members um, supported that grandfathering clause. The green infrastructure master plan, I am very proud of, as well as plan 2040. Um, and those are things that we have to implement, so we'll talk about that. Um, but getting to 30% of the land mass of the county protected by the year 2030 is a big goal, but it's one that is so, so important. I know you're about to kick me out, aren't you? Okay, well, I'll talk about the other ones soon. Thank you. You want to respond? Yes, I do. I, I'm a little amazed, actually. Look, I don't care who gets credit for anything. Um, it, you can get a lot done if you don't care who gets credit for something. But I would never stand up here and try and take credit for something that somebody else did. To be clear, I spoke to Mr. Trombauer after the legislation I had already drafted, and he said, this is a great idea. You beat us to it. Good job. This was not something that he and I discussed together that then we worked on together. I'm very proud of my co-sponsorship. I'm glad we agree on this, but I'm amazed that you would try and take credit for somebody else's work. Um, in terms of the nursery's legislation and the lawsuits, the lawsuits are public. You can go see them online. Do you want to respond to that? Uh, it's not a new idea to raise the rainy day fund level. It's, it's every administration talks about it every year. We knew we were ready to do it because we had the revenues to do it, and that's why it happened. Great, thank you. Um, we all understand uh, the tension between providing water access and pr protecting the environment. Uh, we live uh, in that uh, dilemma here in the county and certainly on the Mayo Peninsula. But a third factor that is unique to us is the parks traffic and the impact it has on the communities where the parks are located. So balancing water access, preserving the natural environment, and safety for the communities in which the parks are located. What's your assessment of the current state and future of the parks on the Mayo Peninsula? Mr. Pittman? Well, it was um, very controversial. Uh, the whole discussion about Beverly Triton Nature Park, um, about Mayo Beach Park, and, um, and the reason it was so controversial is because there was practically warfare going on between water access advocates and some residents who wanted to protect the community from floods and floods of people. Um, I went out to Beverly Triton, uh, and I went, out to, I went out to both parks actually on one weekend in the hot, hot summer, and we had staff in that um, dusty parking lot across from Beverly Triton, which is now you know where they're they're putting the road, and um, watch people drive up and get turned away. We had extra police officers stationed out there, and we had extra Rec and Park staff, and it was heartbreaking seeing these families who drove, who knows 
how long, um, get there and then find out that they had to turn around. And that's why people would park in neighborhoods and just hang out and party anywhere they could or try to go onto a private beach. Um, so the park pass system was something that I'm very proud that we did. I think Wreck-It Parks did the right thing there. Not everybody thinks it's the right thing, but the result of it was that uh, people know if the parks are full, and so they're far, far less likely to go to the parks and drive out onto the end of this peninsula. And I've heard, I've heard rave reviews on that, that it's been, that's been a big improvement. Um, you know, the parking, particularly going to Mayo Beach, um, uh, I went and I met with the neighbors there, um, and, and James Kitchen was out there a lot of times, and our staff had a lot of meetings about this, and, um, and it was unacceptable for people to be parking in front of, of people's houses like that. So good news system. I think the key is that we cannot take a peninsula community and create a bunch of destination parks. So um, there will always be people wanting and needing water access, and that's great. We just cannot overflow them. I think it was the right thing to do to scale back the parking somewhat at Beverly Triton Nature Park, um, but to have parking on site that is safe um, where they're not parking in neighborhoods. So I think we're making progress. It will always be a challenge because I also support public water access. We need to make the Chesapeake Bay available for people so that they'll, they'll work to preserve it and protect it for the future. So more specifically though, your, what do you see as the future for these parks? Well, park by park. So what I don't see as the future, for instance, for South Shore Park is the master plan. And we had a big conversation about what to do about the master plan. And the only way to get rid of a master plan is to do an, another master plan. And I said, we're not ready this year to do another master plan. We need a whole process of community engagement. And in fact, we need to improve the community engagement process at Rec and Parks, and we wanna do that. South Shore Park should be a very low intensity park um, and it will remain that way. We will not build the, the, the kind of all the parking and the, the Disneyland version of that. I could see some kayak launches there. Um, I know somebody who would love to have some Frisbee golf there. That kind of low intensity stuff would, would be good there. Um, you know, the Waterworks Park, I don't see building ball fields there. We may get into that topic as well. And, and, um, and we need to protect the infrastructure we have at Mayo Beach, which is why I was at a wedding there recently and the air conditioning didn't work. It, was, it felt moldy and gross in there. And there's gonna be some improvements to those buildings so that we can continue having good events there. Um, but we're not gonna do the paved parking. We're not gonna do the stuff that was in the master plan there as well. So um, I'm for spending a little bit less money on infrastructure on some of these so that people can actually enjoy the natural beauty of what's out here. Thank you. Jessica, and both, both questions. Um, your assessment now, and what do you, what, how do you see the future for these parks? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I remember actually also in 2017, 2018, and then 19, et cetera, we had a lot of meetings on this, about what we were gonna do on, on which parks, how we were gonna scale back. I actually, on this one, I think Mr. Pittman and I and our offices have, have probably agreed on a lot of it. Um, I know that James Kitchen, um, his constituent services director, and I, and also my legislative aide, Matt Pipkin, have participated in a number of uh, community meetings and also online um, community meetings where folks are discussing the past system uh, the, the roads that need to go out there. I remember saying back in 2018 that I'm a big fan of infrastructure first, safety first, and when I say infrastructure first, I mean the road infrastructure. Right now, um, you know, look, it's one lane in and one lane out, so there's only so much you can handle, and, and we agree these cannot be huge destination areas. It's just not what this peninsula can handle. Um, so from a future perspective, I do think passive recreation in a lot of these parks is, is really where it should head, and that should be about it. I think we also can help. In addition, I think the pass system is great, but we can also help by making some of the other parks in the county a little bit more accessible. Sometimes folks don't know about some of the other great parks we have, or they can't, they're not um, easily accessible from an ADA perspective. We need a little bit better signage, things like that in some of these other areas, and I think we can make some improvements um, we can make some improvements there. Did I get an answer? Okay. Yeah, Do you want to respond? Is, nope. sounds, sounds like you're more in agreement than not on this. Yep. Right. This one, I think we're good. I think you're good, exactly right. Um, so we hear a lot of concerns and complaints about uh, county services and inadequate county services. Uh, the stormwater damage at the Heb property um, over here in back of uh, Sam's, uh, the tree damage at Cars Wharf, uh, roads in uh, need of resurfacing, um, two consecutive summers, repairs to 214 have been scheduled but stopped because of rain on scheduled dates. So how would you make sure that uh, this work gets done? And in particular, 
What will you do to improve the responsiveness of local government to citizens in need of county services? You first. Okay. Thank you very much. So on the responsiveness piece, uh, look at my day job as an attorney, if I don't return a phone call uh, or an email to a client timely, I don't have a client anymore. Right? So I think we need to implement some of these policies. I talk a lot about having a 48 hour policy where if somebody sends an email into the county or a phone call into the county, you get a return email or a return phone call within those two days. Now, they may not have a full answer to your problem, but it's to say, I got your email. Here are the steps I'm gonna to take to work on it. Let's touch base again in X number of days while I'm working on this solution. Um, I think that's something that we can absolutely put into place. I think it will make a big difference. Uh, when we are talking then about those services, some of this I think is just rolling up your sleeves and going out there and doing it. We, I talked a little bit in my opening about uh, a property that was having flooding issues down here on the Mayo Peninsula. It took me several visits and then I partnered very well with DPW, huge shout out. They were phenomenal on this, but we went and worked with them and said, can we monitor this because this is an anomaly. What's going on here? How can we help? They studied it for a couple of weeks, figured out that there was a tidal issue. So when a storm was coming and the tidal, was, uh, the tidal flow was backing up, it was creating this, it was overwhelming a system that was only designed to handle uh, the storm. So we put in a check valve into this culvert to slow down any um, back, uh, any tidal flood that was coming up from it. It only allows the water to go one way and now that system can function as it was intended. So much of this is looking at things you know it's a factual inquiry it's a it's a one-off on a one-by-one -one basis but I think with that dedication and that proactive approach we can we can make sure that these things happen in a timely fashion Great. thank you Stuart so there's a lot of levels of these the system that's set up is starts with the real simple stuff which is c-click fix 311 that goes into a database and we monitor how quickly each department manages to resolve the cases the more difficult cases sometimes go through that to CECS, Community Engagement Constituent Services, James Kitchen is here who runs that, um, or they, um, they go directly to those folks because people know them and they call them and they get the newsletter and they're, they're well connected. And those cases are the, usually the more complicated ones. They bring them to me every week at a weekly meeting where they bring, bring forth cases where uh, there's not an easy answer. It's gonna be interdepartmental and it might require a little bit of pressure from the county executive's office to get extra attention to it. Um, and in some cases it requires a legislative change or a policy change. And those are the really hard ones. Um, so in terms of responsiveness, uh, 48 hours to me is, is too long. Uh, we want it to be uh, as soon as possible, you you have situations where um, where there's a an, an answer that they're working on, so it takes longer to get the answer to get back. But there has to be an initial response that yes, we're at least working on it, and I believe we're we're very good at that. Um, we can always do better. Um, the um, the worst parts are the permitting system, and that's a whole other topic that we could get into, but we have a whole effort to streamline our permitting processes and make them easier. But one of the things that we're gonna implement that's gonna be new is that there will be a customer survey that everybody and anybody can, can fill out immediately after interacting with any part of county government so that we can look at those as well as just the response times. And, uh, and um, it's always gonna be hard. But if you, if you cut funding significantly and you start shrinking the number of people in the agencies or shrinking their pay, that's when things really start to get bad. And we've seen that uh, in this county and we've seen it in other counties when that's happened. You start to lose services. So um, stormwater is a big issue. Uh, we've got a community here in Ponder that is uh, having huge problems with stormwater. The state or the county has come out and tried to put in some culverts. They don't drain. Um, as I, I mentioned, the head property uh, down the street here, uh, off our peninsula, we have lots of problems with uh, small, um, densely developed uh, townhouse communities uh, where the um, uh, stormwater uh, is just not properly managed. So a larger question for both of you, and it's important, I think, because um, we're so close to the bay and all the stormwater contributes to uh, the waters and the rivers and the bays. What, what do you see as the, county, the county's right approach to stormwater management? And uh, what would you have the county do, not just on the Mayo Peninsula, but as a policy level um, or a practice level to address uh, stormwater issues? 
Okay. Whose turn is it? Who goes first? Okay. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, from day one, we got more CECS complaints, community engagement um, on stormwater issues than almost anywhere. And I remember when I was running, there was the, um, the clear cutting of what became Turnbull Estates. And they had failed to identify wetlands on that site, which is why they got that stop work order from Maryland Department of Environment. You saw I used those in my campaign ads and all of that. But, um, they had failed to identify them. And so the first thing that we had to do when we came in was to, to, start, to make sure that um, every environmental feature on every subdivision application was identified and then actually have people go out and check so that that would never happen again. Um, the, uh, the green notices that we then put out, uh, Matt Johnson, our environmental policy director that some of you know, um, put together a lot of this work. Green notices that, that required the, the develop, that told the developers how we were gonna look at environmental modifications, which is how they would get around the code for environmental features, and said that we would not grant those at all unless they did something to offset or make the situation better. Um, we created a stormwater strike team at inspections and permits so that in addition to just looking at the performance of the stormwater on a, on a site, they would look around it and see what kind of erosion was happening and trace it back um, and then hold the developer accountable. And then another thing that we did was legislation that had to get passed, and I promised this from, from I think even during the campaign, was that they were not bonding. They were, we were not requiring the stormwater to actually work. As long as they did what we said they had to do in the plan, uh, they built it and then they walk away, the developer, and if it didn't work, that you couldn't hold them accountable. Um, so we got legislation passed that requires them to bond the performance of those stormwater systems so that then we can go back and hold them accountable. And we're actually doing that on some sites right now. Um, so all of those things must continue um, and we must be vigilant about them because uh, we're having more and more and more rain. Um, we've created the resilience authority, but we can talk about that in another, quest in another question because it's only getting worse. Thank you very much. So um, I was actually out at Ponder Cove, couldn't have been that long ago, um, walking around and driving around trying to see all of these issues. Of course, water flows downhill, right? And you're when you're this close to the water, it all goes down. So it's a, it's a super difficult issue to solve from an engineering perspective. I remember getting on the phone with uh, Chris Phipps, who's the director of DPW, immediately afterwards and saying, we have to take care of this water. I mean, we have to get it out. You know, do we have any studies that show the hydraulics on here? What can we look at? And so I was actually able to put my hands on a study, it's about 20 years old now, um, that looked at just this issue. And it's something we absolutely have to address moving forward. I think we need to look at designing our systems to handle more than what the systems are currently, currently what's required. Um, because clearly we're getting more water than what the code requirements and the state law requirements think we're going to get. So one of the things I think we need to do is look at changing those requirements and, and increasing the design standards for those. I was very happy to support the legislation that increased that bonding requirement for contractors when they're building. We expanded it, I believe, from two years to three years on the county council. That's absolutely something we need to be doing so that we're making sure these systems are functioning long after they're put in so somebody can't just put it in and then, you know, Walk, wipe, walk away and say, oh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, but I think those, those design issues are the first way that we've got to tackle. Uh, we're seeing this issue not just here, but all over peninsulas. I have an issue uh, right now at Bell Branch Park where uh, some constituents who live right behind Bell Branch Park called me out and said, every time it rains, my backyard is flooding now. And this didn't happen before the park was built. And so again, able to get on the phone with DPW and talk to them. And they said, well, first things first, we're going to go install some check dams that'll help slow down the water and give the uh, uh, ditches time to to filter the water a little bit better there's a lot of small solutions like this that can make a difference and if we're doing that in tandem with uh, expanding our minimum requirements for design I think we can make a big difference but um, two things I want to give a big shout out for DPW because they do heroic work and if you were out here after the tornadoes you saw the work that they did in our in our fire department and our everybody so um, we have wonderful public servants that we need to thank when they do good work um, and but but I want to give a shout out to to um, uh, Senator Alfred because on that issue of increasing the the standards for stormwater so that they actually um, reflect the amount of rain that we get not what we got a decade ago um, Senator Alfred introduced legislation got it passed that does exactly that work with Matt power Matt Matt Johnston on that and uh, I would like to see us do that, not just for stormwater, but also erosion and sediment control, control at construction sites. 
Um, I was on I was on the uh, the board that oversees those, and they're just not adequate, um, and we have to do better on those as well. You want to respond? Sounds like he agrees with me. I think. <laughs> <laughs> we have this is a terrible dilemma we have. We have two candidates who have served this area very very well in their different roles. How do you choose between these two people? And I'm no further. I'm no further. <laughs> I'm no further down that, I've been writing the questions, I'm no further down that road than I was an hour ago. Um, the critical area codes and enforcement um, is a, an area that uh, we hope you would uh, both consider, particularly eliminating the buffer modification areas. And it, it's a little wonky, it's a little technical, but um, just wondering if either of the two of you can speak to that. We talked about this in the past, particularly about some of the older properties that theoretically uh, had um, were platted prior to 1985. Is that what you're getting at? Well, I want to talk to grandfathering later. Okay. Yeah, grandfathering is my next thing. Okay. But this is just, um, this is strengthening the oversight and tightening the guidelines for the critical areas. Sure. I, I believe in incentives more than anything else. I think carrots better than sticks tend to work. So I like to incentivize folks to build out of that buffer modification area. See if we can do things that say, look, if you're willing to do X, Y, or Z and put in a living shoreline and do this, then we'll expedite your permit review. Um, there are things that I think we can do at the county to try and help folks guide them into the way that we, that we would like them to do. Enforcement is always enforcement it should be enforced if you have a rule people should play by the rules um, so if we need to tighten that up uh, i'm all ears if something is not being enforced the way that it's ought to be enforced yeah i mean i i think it now it is very difficult to get any kind of a modification if you're if you're um, um in that area in the critical area but um, i do want to say that our code is a mess on land use and that's one of the reasons why permitting takes so long and it takes so many people to be at plan and zoning to do the work because um, it's not been done comprehensively what happens is that you have a council bill with an idea that comes in then another one on top of that another one and they're not necessarily coordinated and often um, the folks that actually do it at a plan and zoning are just they're tearing their hair out as the council is making amendments to these things that to them they know are going to be almost impossible to, to implement. And so um, that's why it is so difficult to get anything done and it takes so long. Um, so we want good development to be easy. We want that bad development to be impossible in our county. And um, what I plan to do in the next, the next term when we have a new council, I think it will be um, easier to do this. Uh, there will be probably less partisan bickering and I'll just say one reason for that is that the county executive will be term limited that's me um, which means that there won't be this incentive to try to make sure that I fail so that I don't get reelected I think a lot of these partisan votes that took place over the last four years were because they didn't want they wanted to make sure that their party ended up in office in the county executive's office. It happens in Congress too. So what happens if it's not that way is that we can all work together and I think that the future council um, will be able to do some major, major rewriting of the code so that we streamline it but also really strengthen our environmental protections and our adequate public facilities protections. The only thing I'll respond to is that I will say actually, like I said, I've passed the most number of bipartisan bills on the county council and I've done that from the minority. So building consensus is something that I pride myself on. I've also voted for a number of bills of my counterparts and have worked together. Some of the bills I've passed, I've had sponsored by uh, members on the other side and I have co-sponsored bills from members on the other side. So certainly I, I don't think any bill has ever passed on a party line vote because we thought we didn't want you to be reelected. That's that's awfully hyperpartisan, and it's not the way that I work, and it's not the way that my colleagues work. Um, many times, bills pass on a party line vote, or fail on a party line vote, because folks say, "Well, I don't need your vote to pass this bill, so I'm not going to work with you to make a compromise on the bill." And that's really we, where we get stuck. There have been a number of bills where, if I've put up an amendment, it was a compromise that I was offering, and I thought I can get there if we can make this compromise. But the amendment fails on a party line vote, and then the bill gets shoved through on a party line vote, and that's that's where those party line votes come from. Want to respond? No. Okay, good. So um, we have <laughs> no, I don't. Think. We have um, a property here, um, just to, next door to the uh, to the American Legion, that the application was submitted in 2008 
and um, the submission has been updated and revised just recently. It's called the Sudath property, and um, the revisions do not reflect the current code. The revisions reflect the code as it was in effect in 2008 when they submitted their first application. We went round and round with the developer of the Glebe Heights Forest for the same reason. He submitted his application before the forest conservation law. And even though he submitted applications after the forest conservation law, and he submitted revisions after the forest conservation law, he was grandfathered. And so the grandfathering, the county's understanding of grandfathering is the date in which you submit is the date that governs and the rules that govern uh, for the rest of the project. And what's happened now in the Sudduth property is that uh, they're using, they're, they're, instead of containing the runoff on the individual home sites, they're bringing in 20,000 tons of dirt to build the home sites up and then truck the water out to 214 and under 214 and out to Bear Neck Creek. So the, the, the policy question is, what's the point at which grandfathering is dysfunctional? And are either of you willing to stand up and say, we're gonna change our concept, to grandfa our, our concept of grandfathering and either sunset it after a period of time, I'm going back to the 85 grandfathering that we talked about, um, or some other approach so that we don't have all these zombie developments that are being governed by rules that are 15 and 20 years old. Uh, who goes first? I think, I think Stuart goes first. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, so I think to answer your question, and I'm going to sound like an attorney right here, it depends. So <laughs> yes, I think there is a point at which we need to sunset grandfathering, but that presupposes that you have a good working relationship between the Office of Planning and Zoning and Inspections and Permits and whoever is submitting this plan. Um, what I don't want to see happen is somebody submits something and then it takes eight months to get a response from, from the county. And then we say, oh, well, your time's run out, right? We have to be good partners too. But I do think there's a reasonableness aspect to this. And so I do think it's perfectly appropriate to say, okay, you're grandfathered if you submit by this date. You have to get to the final stage by this date. But the county's got to be a good partner in that too. And we have to timely respond. Um, I, I, I get calls from folks sometimes where they say, hey, I was owed a comment letter. I had a, a husband and wife who called me the other day, they were, they're building just one, one home and they were owed a comment letter, um, 50 something, no, they were 20 something days overdue on their comment letter. You get 30 days to get it and it had been 50 something days and they said, where's my comment letter? So those are the types of things we have to be making sure that we're doing our part to timely get out these comment letters, timely respond and to really work with anyone. Um, but I, but then I agree there can be an appropriate place. Years. Right. 15 years is an awfully long time. <laughs> Not waiting for a comment letter right. for 15 years. Right, or 1985, as you said. Um, you know, at some point, it, it does make sense. Everyone knows. We usually put grandfathering provisions in because you don't want to change the rules on somebody mid-submission, mid-project, um, because that, that can cause a lot, of, a lot of difficulty. But at some point, they've had adequate notice of it and, and should be moving on. Yeah, too long. <laughs> um, and that's not even the longest one. I mean, the longest one that I know of is the Chesapeake Terrace landfill um, over there by Two Rivers, where they got a special exception to be able to um, to do this thing and have extended it and extended it and extended it. And sometimes it's the Board of Appeals that extends it. And and uh, we managed to get to the point finally where the only the only their special exception said that they had to enter at a certain location, and they were stupid enough to not buy that land, so we did. So we're building a school there so they can't get in. Now they believe that we have to now give them another entrance. We believe otherwise, um, but that's what the legal battle is gonna be all about over the next period of time because they just won't give up. Um, but it was a radical notion when we introduced no grandfathering on, on the forest conservation bill. And we did that because we had lost so much, so much forest in this county that we just said, we're not gonna lose anymore. And we knew we might get sued. We knew that it was gonna lower the value of some land that some speculators owned that had a lot of trees on it um, that was already in the pipeline. But uh, we were willing to take that risk. So it really, I think, is whether the council has the political will to pass legislation that has no grandfathering and whether the council has the political will to amend the law so that it prevents the grandfathering. 
Glad your viewers answered the, the direct question, I'll ask it again. <laughs> and that is, are you willing to put forward some type of um, age cap on grandfathering so that weeks, years, months, decades, decades don't pass between a submission and uh, final approval? Because, not because it's taking all that time in, in uh, OPZ to review, but because um, uh, the, the, the developer has let years and years lapse, as in the Sadov property, 10, ten years lapse between his, his, uh, his submissions. And a whole new set of environmental regulations were implemented, including the forest conservation law, and he doesn't have to comply with any of them because his submission date was 2008. So are either of you willing to put forward uh, something uh, assertive that would sunset grandfathering at some level at some time? Oh, sorry. I thought I, I thought it was my turn. Um, yes. Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, but there's no time for council bills before this election, so it'll be part of the larger rewrite of the code uh, at the beginning of the next term. Thank you. That's that's a huge commitment. And I, I thank you both. I think we all thank you both, because grandfathering has been the bane of our existence on a lot of these, a lot of these developments. You have both been very helpful and supportive in the efforts to improve safety, and to address the drainage and traffic issues on 214. But there are voices on the peninsula that oppose any improvements for fear of inviting more development. How do you respond to that? Any improvements to the road? You mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a state road they were saying yeah 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 we'll look at it and the community was saying we need we need to have a way to get around vehicles when there's an accident we it's a one lane in one one laid out this is a peninsula we have these all over the county in fact we've created them in some places like two rivers um with one rate one road in and one road out um, so the only way we could get the state to step up is if we bribed them, basically. And this is the way we got um, from having one of the top 10 state priorities for their roads to getting six of the top 10, even though we're only 10% of the population of the state, by saying on Route 2, Route 3, Central Avenue, and other locations that we're willing to put some money on the table so that we'll pay some of it if you will prioritize it and actually do it. And in this case, we had to do actually 100% of design, um, which allowed us to work with the community and for them to work with the community. So there's been a lot of community engagement on that. So I get that there are people who worry that if you improve it, then there will be more development. But some of that development is by right and it's infill, and so we need to improve it anyway, but we need to improve it for the people who live here now, and that's why we're doing it. So the first thing I would say is October 20th, I believe it is, at 6 p.m., there is a public meeting about this. DPW is holding a public meeting. So go look at the possibilities. There have been, over the last couple of years, a number of these meetings. Uh, at first, it was they had a study based on the current conditions of the road. Then they did a study looking at all various different opportunities where they could make safety fixes and intersection fixes along the road, and, and that came out. And now they're, they're at the point where they're ready to present uh, this to you. So definitely go participate it's your opportunity to say I like this I don't like this please change this and here's why um, it's certainly a tug and pull the engineer in me I always default to safety improvements uh, because I think that they are critical for folks right now we have a road where um, you know if a tree falls down or there's a fire the, the fire truck is blocking the whole road people cannot get on or off the peninsula it becomes a very big safety risk so my um, I tend to fall on the side of we need something so that we have we, we're assured of safety when power lines come down or when um, like I said there's a fire and, and the fire truck is there if we have some extra roadway there people can still get by or an ambulance can get by if it needs to um, but look ultimately this is this is something for the community to to weigh in on and so October 20th is is definitely the time to come do that it was um, February of 2019 that uh, the road was closed five times uh, most of the time in the afternoon on the school buses and the parents were trying to get home and uh, um, it was a couple of months later, we happened to have the fire chief come to one of our Mayo Matters uh, sessions down at the Selby Clubhouse. And we invite people who know something to come and tell us something they know. And so we asked her about 214. And she said, 
I can't get my fire trucks down there. I can't get them turned around. And part of the reason that uh, 214, uh, that those closures weren't as long as they were is because I couldn't move my equipment around. And uh, for me, that was a, a powerful uh, argument in favor of adding shoulders and uh, potentially a third lane. And so, yes, I agree with Jessica. Come to that meeting on October the 20th, see the plans, give feedback on the plans. Uh, there'll be three phases. The first phase is uh, the next two or three years from Muddy Creek to uh, Camp Letts, uh, so that there'll be a left turn lane into the Summit School. Uh, the second phase will be Camp Letts down to Ponder, and the third phase will be Ponder to the end of the peninsula. So, uh, and, o and only um, uh, adding lanes at, at the front end, not adding lanes, but, but taking care of drainage and taking care of shoulders the whole way down. All right, uh, last question here. Um, and that is, there's um, been a lot in the news even today about large campaign contributions from developers. What's your response to these stories and how do you keep an arm's distance from campaign contributors, especially when they have business before the county? And uh, would you support a ban on contributions from developers who have a current application before the county? And I've lost track. I think it's Stuart, you go first on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I firmly believe that our campaign finance system is broken. And uh, we've seen it in this county for, for a long time. And the stories are rampant. And I could tell you stories all evening, but I won't about um, situations where large campaign contribution, bundling of campaign contributions, events, um, you know, 6,000 is the max, but you can, you can get all your employees and you can get all of your, your LLCs and you can, get, um, you can get all of your family and they all do 6,000 and it ends up being a whole lot of money and decisions have gotten made in the past that shouldn't have gotten made as a result of that. I said that we needed to ban campaign contributions from developers when they have applications pending. Prince George's County had done this. I went and I talked to Rashawn Baker about how that worked. Um, we went, we needed state authorization. So we went to the state and we got authorization to be able to do a local ban on campaign contributions from developers with applications pending. Um, we drafted the legislation, we started to shop it around the council. I wanted to do it anyway, even though we weren't gonna get the votes. It was very clear that we would be lucky to get a couple of votes for that. Um, and I was told, and I think they're probably right in retrospect, that introducing legislation that's just gonna embarrass your friends is not gonna help you the next time you have a bill. So you don't introduce a bill you don't think you can get passed. And so we never actually introduced that bill. So we pivoted and we said, okay, well, let's do what some other counties have done. And what the state of Maryland does is a public option for folks who wanna do small donor campaigns. So the way it works in other counties, and Governor Hogan used this to get elected governor because he wasn't the big money, he didn't have the big money machine. Um, you, you agree to only get contributions up to a certain point. It's usually in the two, 300 range, $250 range, as opposed to 6,000. And, and then if you get enough of them, you qualify for public financing where they match it or they give you three to one, whatever the ratio is. And, and what it does is it allows people who don't have good connections in the, the big money world to be able to compete and run for office. And the amount of public money that it actually is spent doing this is surprisingly small. I mean, we could probably do this a million dollars in election cycle because a lot of candidates would use big money still but they would be, the others would be able to compete. So we introduced a bill to be able to get that on the ballot. So the voters could at least decide whether they want this. And we needed five votes because that's what it takes to get something on the ballot. We were only able to get four. We got, I mean, I'll just go ahead and say it. We got the four Democrats, the three Republicans said no. We could have used one Republican vote and that would have done it. Somebody who actually liked the way Larry Hogan got elected. Um, so uh, I'm gonna bring this back. Uh, we could have gotten 10,000 signatures to get it on. Some folks did go out and get signatures. They got over 10, but some of them weren't valid. You really need to get 20 to get down to 10. Um, it's going to happen in this county if, uh, if I have anything to say about it. I think the next council, we can probably get that fifth vote. Jessica? Thank you. First, I'll note that that bill that you mentioned to ban campaign contributions from people with business before the council was never shopped around to me. I don't know who it was shopped around to. It might have been shopped around to some folks on the council, but maybe not everybody. Um, Did you have some more I might have actually. Um, depends on what it said. I'd have to take a look at it. 
But beyond that, I want to note a couple of things. Um, look, I've taken campaign contributions from developers. Mr. Pittman has put out ads about me taking campaign contributions from developers. I've also voted consistently on the council against density bonuses for a variety of projects. Um, so if we talk about density bonuses for, for housing units, Bill 5419, I voted against that. Bill 6322, I think it was, that gave a density bonus um, because it had a loophole, just like Two Rivers did when it converted from uh, age-restricted housing to non-age-restricted housing. This Bill 6322 had that same loophole in it. I voted against that density bonus. So the idea that you could be bought by campaign contributions, my record directly contradicts that. Uh, I will also note that when Mr. Pittman talks about that landfill and he talks about my campaign contributions, the bill and the resolution that he talks about to purchase the, the land for the school, I voted in favor of purchasing that land for the school. So it's also pretty ironic to try and say, oh, you're, you're bought by developers, you're going to try and do X, Y, or Z when my record consistently reflects the opposite. Uh, I've also put out a, an advertisement talking about Mr. Pittman and his campaign contributions. He's taken developer money too. And in fact, this year, a company, Conifer Realty, came and purchased a piece of property in Odenton in March. In April, they gave Mr. Pittman a campaign contribution, and in June, he introduced legislation at the county council to give them millions of dollars over the course of 40 years in tax breaks to build high-density apartments in Odenton. I am not accusing Mr. Pittman of doing anything illegal, but he can't come up here and suggest or put out ads and suggest that I am doing that. So I think, really, I put money into my own campaign. The only people I answer to are you, the residents, and I think that that's the way you handle that. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's good to actually have this conversation in person because this has been going back through ads and, and that's, you know, 30 second spots and that's, that's just kind of ugly. But um, I think we can both admit that <laughs> the way that works is unfortunate um, in 30 second spots. But um, first of all, I, I, I do think that it really, it really does matter. And you know when you when you do say that you voted for the school to be there and that shows that you were against the landfill but you also said you hadn't heard about the landfill at the time you voted for the school so that was what you said in that candidate forum that were, that the capital reported on that you had just heard about the landfill two days before we know that there's evidence to say that that wasn't the case but um, so thank you for voting for the school but as you said you didn't know that there was a landfill nearby so it had nothing to do with that um, but you know I, I if you read Herbert Malin's column this morning uh, in the Capitol he talked extensively about this and what he said and I actually agree with him I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff but he said that Pittman got twenty five hundred dollars from a company that does affordable housing, and Pittman has been working on affordable housing for decades, for years on the, uh, in this job. And, and when, you, when you say that the problem is that it's density, I see density as a dog whistle for we don't want those kind of people. We don't want low income housing. Density is in plan 2040 as the way we protect open space. That's what smart growth is all about, is you do the development in higher density, smaller town centers, transit oriented development, and mixed use so that you can protect open space. That is what the definition of smart growth is. So um, I am proud of the contributions that I've gotten from folks who support the kind of things that I support. Um, and, and I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Just a couple of quick things. I'm not surprised that you agreed with Mr. McMillan this morning. I thought actually maybe you might have written the column for him. Um, <laughs> let me let me just say a couple of quick things. Number one, I'm against the landfill. Um, when I what I said in that candidate forum during the primary was that I was not familiar with all of the issues that were there. Um, it was not my district. I had not spoken to Councilman Prusky about it specifically. I then immediately went uh, and visited with some of the folks there. I drove the road specifically. I talked to them. I'm opposed to the landfill. It doesn't make any sense. At the time, the special exception was granted 30 some odd years ago. Uh, it was Two Rivers wasn't there. Now there are homes within something like 500 feet of where it would go. It doesn't make sense. Um, and so I'll say that I've said it publicly on my Facebook page. I've said it to a number of newspapers. Uh, I'm opposed to that landfill. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll say on this is, oh, and then my thought just went right out of my head. Maybe that's just a good spot to end it then. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll come back to your closing yeah, comment. Closing comment? And let me just, pardon, let me just 
So we advertised that we would finish here at 8.30. Uh, with your permission, we're gonna go to 8.45. So we're gonna, this is the last of the county executive panel. <laughs> the state senator panel will start momentarily. Um, we need to be out the door by nine o'clock. So we're gonna finish at 8.45 and ask you to help us break down the room and put the chairs away and, and skedaddle out of here in a hurry, okay? Okay, closing comments. I was going to say something about the last thing, but I won't. I'm actually proud of the payment in lieu of taxes that every affordable housing development gets that gets low-income housing tax credits. There were six voted on that night. They knew long before they ever did it that they were going to get it, and that is a tax break. And I would think that everybody who supports tax relief would support that tax break. Um, but I will just close by saying thank you for coming. I mean, we know that many of you have already decided before you walked in here who you're going to vote for. Maybe there's one or two of you who have changed your mind or come to a conclusion. Um, I, would, I would humbly ask for your vote. Um, I believe that the team that we have put together uh, to move this county forward is an outstanding team, and we want to keep that team together. Um, I, I believe that the work that we started on Plan 2040, the Green Infrastructure Master Plan, will not be completed unless I'm in office to do so. I believe that the small area, the, the region plans, the stakeholder advisory committees, will not be implemented in a robust way for you to have a voice unless I am here to usher that process through. And that's why I want to continue for four more years before I go back to the farm and go back out to pasture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will echo thank you all so much for being here this evening and sharing your night with us. It is so critically important to hear from you and hear your questions. And so I very much appreciate that that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, we didn't talk as much about all of the different legislation that we've passed on the council, so I do want to just highlight a couple of things that I'm also very proud of. Uh, I was the lead sponsor on a successful bill to put in a property tax credit for service disabled veterans in this county, was able to get a unanimous uh, support on that bill. I was the lead sponsor on a piece of legislation to eliminate the fee for our public safety officers when they uh, go in to apply for their property tax credit. I've been the lead sponsor on a number of bills, like I said, to help revitalize aging infrastructure, folks with failing septic systems, I actually worked with um, the then uh, Director of Environmental Policy on a task force because um, failing septic systems are the third leading cause of nitrogen pollution in the Bay. So that was a very exciting time for me to try and work on that and put together a program that hopefully over the next number of years will, will uh, be influential in, in helping to remove some of that nitrogen. It's a double bang for your buck as well because it's much more uh, efficient to remediate that on the front end than it is to try and pull the nitrogen out of the Bay on the back end. So like I said, these are the guiding principles. I take uh, a deep love of this country from my military roots, a deep commitment to hard work from my mom, and a deep dedication to improving the lives of Anne Arundel County residents through common sense, innovation, and efficiency. The one thing I will promise you is that I will lead proactively, and I will lead with logic, and that I will ensure that every single individual Every family and every small business knows that my administration is invested in our shared success as a community. So I ask for your vote on November 8th, and I will absolutely stick around afterwards if anybody's got any further questions that didn't get answered. If you'd like some literature, I have some literature on the back there that gives a little bit about me. There is an email address on the bottom that I do answer personally, and a little QR code there if you'd like to get on our mailing list. Thank you so much, and have a great evening. Thanks for the many questions we didn't get to about taxes and about um, South County transportation and about the gun violence and about the budget and about um, uh, cutting spending and uh, COVID relief money. So we didn't, we're going to try to get to some of these in the Senate uh, candidate uh, forum, which we're going to start now. So um, is Stacy here? There you are. Come on up, Stacy. So let me introduce Sarah Elfrith, our incumbent in District 30 State Senate. And Stacey McDonald, who's opposing her for District 30 here in the State Senate. 
We'll follow a similar format, okay? I'll ask a question, give you each two minutes to respond to it. Less would be better, so that if there's something you want to engage with each other on, you can. Okay? We'll go to 845. Is that okay? No babysitters? Home waiting? Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. So let's begin alphabetically. I'll uh, invite uh, Sarah Elfrith to begin with her two-minute introduction. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you to everybody for being here. It's good to see so many familiar faces. And I, I have to tell you, rep represent a big district. It's Annapolis and then all of South County. But I have to say Mayo is the most organized and most engaged community I think I have the privilege of representing. So it's a credit to you all. Um, I'm Sarah Elfrith. I've had the privilege of being your state senator for these last four years. And when I stood in this room four years ago and uh, was first running, I committed uh, that I would be tenacious on your behalf. I hope I've lived up to that promise. In four years, I've worked across the aisle and across the state to pass 65 bills, all with bipartisan support. And that's done by consensus building, that's done by compromise, that's done by taking amendments sometimes I didn't like in order to make sure that the bill was not just what's best for our community, but what's best for the entire state of Maryland. Uh, we're going to talk about some legislation later, so I'm just going to highlight one that I'm very proud of. Uh, the, the pandemic highlighted a lot of cracks in our infrastructure, one of those being the digital divide, that not everybody has access to the internet, and it became incredibly important for seniors and telehealth and kids learning from home uh, when school went online, for small businesses, for farmers to, to actually do their job as well. But we didn't have a plan in Maryland. Uh, 22 other states had statewide offices of broadband and were directing strategically investments in broadband infrastructure. Maryland did not. So we put together a really solid bill, brought together the rural parts of Maryland, the suburban, the urban, passed that bill and directed $400 million <coughs> of federal funding to help fill in the gaps of digital infrastructure in our state. And Maryland was actually named the most improved state for business in 2021 because of that bill, and I'm very proud of that. I serve on the Budget and Taxation Committee where my primary responsibility is to make sure we pass a balanced budget here in Maryland that reflects our values, and we've done that four years in a row. Um, I've had the privilege of bringing money back home to this district from the American Legion helping to repair their, their bathrooms to the Ralph Bunch Center just down the road and, and many other things. But we've also been able to use that budget to pass the largest tax cuts in state history working hand in hand with Governor Hogan. Tax cuts for our small businesses, very important tax cuts for our seniors living on fixed incomes, and then tax cuts for families, like cutting the sales tax on diapers that just didn't make any sense that the state of Maryland was taxing an essential product. That was actually my bill. Um, and we also passed the largest public safety funding uh, budget in state history this past year, working with our police and fire and first responders to do that. And I'm very proud to be endorsed by the police and the firefighters because of that work. But if I didn't pass a single bill or bring any money home, the most important part of my job is being responsive to my constituents. And that's what keeps me up at night if we just cannot solve an issue. Um, I have a wonderful staff, and together we're able to help people who, when the unemployment system broke on day one, we were able to help folks who paid into their unemployment their entire careers and, and were struggling to pay rent or keep food on the table for their kids. We've helped people who are waiting for their MVA licenses, folks uh, who needed vaccines during uh, January 2021 and those dark days. Uh, that's the most important part of my job is being responsive to my constituents, being a problem solver. And that is why I think I have the best job in the world. Common sense, problem solving, and, and community focused. And that's why I asked too for your vote on November 8th so I can keep doing the job that I've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm an independent-minded, passionate business owner and attorney who is running really to bring moderation, common sense, and practicality to the legislature. What has happened in the legislature is it's gotten way too extreme. I've worked, I'm a Republican, but I'm a moderate. I work as Hogan, I've worked with him hand in hand to try to bring Maryland into the middle, into compromise, into moderation. Um, I'm a bipartisan problem solver. And when we talk about bipartisanship, um, we need to really get that straight. It's not a, um, both sides signing on to the same bill for something nicey nice like parks or a little tiny tax break. It's when you really get into the tough issues that I hear about every day, which are the economy, violence, rampant crime, um, funding our police fully in rights and in money. It's those kind of things that you have to come together. And unfortunately, my opponent, one of the reasons I'm running and uh, is she opposed Governor Hogan in four years, 109 out of 109 times when he vetoed something, it came back and the Democratic leadership, which she voted with every single time, um, 
they did not vote with Governor Hogan. So that is not compromise, that is not bipartisanship, and I would like to see somewhere in the middle go on in this legislature. That is what the people of Annapolis have been wanting and needing, and most of this county, and I've talked to so many people in this district and the Mayo Peninsula particularly, really want something like Governor Hogan's uh, style of governance, and that's what I'm running for. Um, in terms of the budgets, we've had a $7 billion surplus this year. We wanted to give complete tax relief to seniors and retirees for years. They've given a, a little tiny $1,000, $1,750 for couples to seniors. I don't understand why it's so little. So with all the new taxes they brought in for Netflix and everything else, it amounts to 1.5% tax break out of a $7 billion surplus. I think you guys know better how to spend your money than the legislature does. That money needs to be returned to the citizens. It's sitting with the legislature in their pet projects. There's been no explanation as to why more money hasn't been given back or why seniors have to leave the state, leave their families behind and their grandchildren because they can't afford to live here anymore. So I'd like to just bring down the crime uh, by a little more in terms of, oh sorry, Violent repeat offender <laughs> laws can be a little bit stricter and deal with the cost of living in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much. So help us get to know you both. Um, you've been our incumbent for a while. Um, Stacy. we don't know you at all. What is there about your personal biographies that make you the best candidate for this job? So I own an assisted living facility where um, I started it we took over a failing business in Maryland, which was Governor Hogan's um, dream to have people come in, move here, bring money, and take over a business, which we did. We created over 100 jobs. I allow uh, residents to move in with their pets without any cost. When the residents pass, I have a passion for pets. We keep the pets at no cost to them. We also take care of the pets at no cost to them. It's been a passion of mine. Um, and I believe that nobody really should be a politician. I've never been a politician without having signed the front of a paycheck, meaning making a payroll. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. It was very difficult during COVID to keep a business alive. And the fact that I've been able to do that, bring people jobs and also take care of these residents um, is one reason. I've also been an attorney, a trial attorney and legislative counsel. I know totally how the legislature runs. I know how to get things done. And prior to this, I've also been an advocate in the community without having been uh, voted in. I helped, um, we actually sued us to Pittman during COVID because we wanted the restaurants to stay open. We've done a lot to try to make this community better. And I think with that, and basically my common sense and life experiences, tragedy and all, have a nap brought me to this place where I'd like to serve the people. I also do not take money from PACs, lobbyists, or special interests. So that is something very new about me. You won't hear that from almost any politician in the world or anyone running for office. And unlike my opponent who has taken, I think at last look, it was 725,000 overall and hundreds of thousands from those groups, often whom give her endorsements, um, you got to think about that. Put your money where your mouth is and wonder where people are getting money from and how they're going to vote. Because I don't have to vote with anyone except you guys, the voters, because I haven't taken any money. So that's it. What is it about your biography that makes you the best candidate for this job? Thank you so much, Matt. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I don't begrudge anybody who did well in life and has personal wealth. I didn't have that. I came from a union household. My father drove trains. My mother was in law enforcement. She was a probation officer. I put myself through school, which I'm very proud of, and I learned a lot of skills in, in doing so. Um, I, in terms of life experiences, I'm very proud of my professional career before I was in the Senate. Um, but one one uh, particular highlight of, of my, my young career was uh, when I chose to put myself out there and be the student member of the Board of Regents for the University System of Maryland when I was, I was 20 years old. And I learned very fast before I could even legally drink that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what gets done is based on relationships. It's based on sitting down with somebody over a meal, getting to know their family, understanding their perspective, what makes them tick, what makes them vote, and, and building a common ground. And I've, I've brought that skill set to the Senate, which is again why I've, I've passed every single bill uh, with bipartisan support. 
And there's a super majority of Democrats in the Senate. I don't have to do that, but it's very important to me that I do. Again, because this is one of the last purple districts in the state, and I want to make sure that the bills that I, I put my name on are common sense, middle of the road, put solutions for, for the entire state of Maryland. Again, I don't begrudge anybody's personal wealth. I don't have the ability to self-fund my campaign. I've relied on the generosity and support of folks in this room, over a thousand individual donors across the district and across the state who agree with me uh, sometimes, maybe not all the time, uh, but see that I show up for my constituents, I work uh, tirelessly to see solutions at the end of the day, and I'm very proud of the support that I've gotten, again, even from folks in this very room and across the state. Thank you. So um, we have several questions about taxes and uh, the budget. And uh, the first, I'm going to combine a couple of them, and a couple of these are left over from the previous panel as well. So what would you do with the $7 billion surplus in the state's budget? Um, and uh, the county and the state got a lot of COVID relief from the Congress and President Biden. Some of it's still not spent. Uh, will you give back the unused COVID relief? And uh, let's just uh, start there. And I think, uh, Sarah, you go first. Thank you. I mentioned I serve on the on the budget and taxation committee. So this is my uh, what I do every day, every year for 90 days is try to balance that budget, try to find cuts uh, to make sure that we are spending within our means, just like every other household. Uh, we have had a few good budget years. Like when I first came in, we were not having good budget years, and we did have to make a number of cuts. Fortunately, we're doing well these days, but the economy is cyclical, and we need to make sure that we have enough in our rainy day fund um, so that if we do, God forbid, have another pandemic, that we're prepared to respond, or that if we do go into a bad market, that we have the means to make sure that government can still function um, even when revenues are down. Now, we were able to use, and I, I was in the back room um, sometimes pounding my fist on the desk, uh, to get that tax relief for seniors. Now, a $1,000 tax credit for an individual or $1,750 for a couple doesn't sound like a lot. That's a tax credit. It means it's equivalent to about $21,000 of income. Now, Maryland doesn't tax Social Security, which is a great thing for seniors. That's about $33,000, $34,000 a year. So you stack those on top of each other. Most most seniors in Maryland, uh, average senior retirement income is about $50,000. They will not be paying state taxes. That's the number I fought for in that back room. I wanted more, but politics is the art of the possible, and I was really happy that I was able to bring my party to the middle to work with Governor Hogan and negotiate that. I like to see us go further. One thing that I've, I've not been able to get done, and I really am passionate about, about this, this particular one, is we have a, a $15,000 uh, 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 tax credit for uh, retirees who are veterans and first responders. I'd like to see that go up, particularly for veterans. Uh, you have to be 55 years old, not a lot of folks in our community when they're retiring out of the military are 55 yet and they're leaving for other states. It's really important to me that we make Maryland the best state to retire, particularly for veterans and particularly for our first responders. We've done some good work, there's a lot of room for growth, and that's going to be my number one priority in the next legislative session. Stacy. As I said earlier, seven billion dollars, one and a half percent has gone back, and that's it. And my opponent has had the chance to give all of that back, some of it, and she talks about it, but really one and a half percent has gone back. Um, she votes with the majority party. If they had wanted to give it back, they would have given it back, and they certainly would have given back more than one and a half percent. During the pandemic, when we were getting the COVID funds, ironically, more taxes came on you, including Netflix streaming devices, which people were using more than ever during the pandemic because they were stuck home. So there's been no explanation why those added taxes had to be cut, had to come in. And if you net that out, that's where I get to that one and a half percent number. For years, the retirees here have wanted to be tax free. They flee to Florida, we know, they flee to Delaware, they have to break up their families to do it, they can't stay with their grandkids. Why are they still paying taxes, especially when there's such a huge budget surplus. All you have to do is look at the party that has been in power. It's gotten so extreme and so ridiculous. Something needs to come to the middle. And all you need to do is ask Governor Hogan and he'll tell you the left side, the Democrats have not come to the middle at all. They have not met what he wanted to do, which was to give senior tax relief and tax relief to veterans. They have not done it. They've not compromised. It's a tiny, tiny slice. They have not done what he wanted at all. Thank you. Okay, so do you want to respond, sir? I would, thank you. Um, I'm not, 
I'm, I'm not sure where the one and a half percent comes from. The tax uh, bills, the tax cuts that we put in place last year are $1.6 billion. Uh, and that's out of a $61 billion budget. And that's sustaining, that's operating money. So we have to, again, live within our means and tax credits, tax cuts, cost the state money. So we have to make sure that we can actually afford to do that. And again, I think what we achieved, while I wanted more and fought for more in that back room, because I'm in the majority party, I had a seat in that back room. And I was able to say, $500 is not enough. We need to, we need to push this further. We need to try to achieve tax-free status for the average Maryland retiree. <coughs> and that's what we we're able to achieve still with $1.6 billion every single year from here on out, that's the cost of it. So I'm not sure where 1.5% comes from, but uh, I think it was, uh, and even the governor said, it was the most meaningful tax relief he had ever seen in eight years. Stacy, in response? $250 million in new taxes during COVID um, is what happened. The governor had fought for years, again, for a full tax relief for seniors and veterans, so I don't understand where that, that tiny number came from. Um, some of the money is going toward programs that there's been no accountability for years. There's been a Thornton program, which has been a study on schools that was costing a billion a year. That didn't work. Nobody had come out with anything that showed any improvement, so they decided to go with the Kerwan program and spend $3 billion a year mandated money um, on that. That's where a lot of that money is going. Again, no accountability for whether our kids are getting a better education for that. So that's where an example of where a lot of the money is going. It's not going back in your pockets where you can decide where it should be spent. So let's continue on this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the Thor Thornton formula was the way that we funded education starting in 2003 until 2019. Uh, it was the state share of our, our what we pay for schools. The county picks up the other, the other part of it depending on how much the county individually wants to put into it. We had an opportunity to rethink that funding formula. And it's not good money after bad. It's just not more money for more money's sake. It's a, a study that looked at not just the best performing schools across the country, but the best performing schools across the world and looked at what are the interventions that are actually going to be held accountable and actually move the needle in terms of student success and preparedness for college and career readiness. And that's exactly what we passed in the Kerwin bill. So paying our educators what they deserve, and gosh, that came at a good time because we're losing educators so far to a greater extent than we, we can train them. Uh, it came in the form of, of when we have kids living in high concentrations of poverty that those kids deserve an extra social worker in those schools who can help them uh, meet their needs. That comes in, in career and technical uh, readiness for kids in high school who don't want to go to college and not everybody should go to college, but we need to create a pathway for them after they graduate. And then the fifth plank of that Kerwin bill literally was accountability. It was oversight up above the State Board of Education, an accountability board that's actually going to make sure that that money is spent by the counties the way it's supposed to and that we're actually going to see student success at the end of the day. Accountability was so important, it was literally the fifth plank of that bill. Stacy. I don't know about you, but I haven't talked to a teacher that feels they're well compensated. Um, they haven't been, they weren't under the Thornton bill, they weren't under the last four years of the legislature, they're not going to be now under the current legislature if it stays as it is. Um, we all know about Baltimore City Schools, you know what we spend on those schools per year, per student, $18,000. And what are we getting? We hear that they don't get air conditioning in their schools. So there has to be more accountability. We don't have the best schools like we had several years ago. The Thornton plan didn't work, and now we're throwing good money after bad. $3 billion instead of $1 billion. doesn't make any sense to me. Without top class schools, um, we shouldn't be spending that money. Great, thanks very much. Um, let's come back to this uh, um, question about the environment. Uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, about uh, from Waterman, or one question from Waterman, who says, um, uh, yes, where's my Waterman question? What's your position on Waterman wanting to harvest oysters from sanctuaries? That's a state matter. Uh, what is your position on having limits on crab and fish harvests? And I think it's Stacy goes first here. All I hear from the watermen is we need a balance between in good environmental policies and the ability to earn a living. And that they have been, so many watermen have come to me 
recently and said they're very unhappy, unfortunately, with the current legislature and particularly uh, Senator Elfbreth because she has not worked with them and they really cannot particularly uh, do any of the oyster harvesting. What really bothers them is the particular environmental policies that are put in place are not helping the water and the environment while they can't do their oyster harvesting. So there has to be something in the middle, uh, again, a balance, something common sense that helps the environment, but also helps the watermen as well. And that hasn't been done. And you do have to follow the money in this case. There has been money given, again, to Senator Alfred from many and many of environmental sources. And I'm not saying that they're all wrong in their environmental policies, but follow the money and then follow the votes and you might see where Senator Elfreth is voting. I haven't taken money from watermen, I haven't taken money from environmentalists and any of the PACs or special interests. I listen to you guys. I listen to the people working, the watermen working. I listen to my neighbors in terms of the environment. I listen to scientists. I listen to the people that really matter. I don't listen to the PACs. I don't listen to people that just give me money. So I would balance it fairly. Yes, but. My question was about, would you support limits on harvesting for oysters and on limits for crab and fish harvests? I'm going to listen to experts on that. Like I said, I would listen to the experts to tell me there's a balance, there's a fair balance between the environmentalists and the watermen on that. Okay, thank you. Sarah? Thank you so much for this question. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work on oysters in the last four years. I've somehow earned the title of the oyster senator, but there's only 47 of us, so we all have to wear multiple hats. Um, I'm, I'm very passionate about this issue. Uh, oysters are an incredible uh, keystone species in the Chesapeake Bay. We all know they filter water, but we all know that they're at about one or 2% of historic levels. Now, we've had some really great years in the last few years, and we have a lot to be proud of in terms of our efforts. I sponsored a bill last year, working with watermen, having many breakfasts and many meetings with watermen, and meetings with environmentalists to bring everybody to the table. And we, we put a bill in that is, is, is supposed to be a rising tide lifting all boats. So increasing the spat production that comes out of the eastern shore so that we have more baby oysters in the bay. That helps our restaurants when they want to recycle those oyster shells instead of throwing them away. That's a great natural resource that we need to keep and, and return back into the bay so they can have a spat set on them and continue to grow. The bill also funds the first bay bottom survey since 1980 because we hadn't been keeping track with, with what the bay bottom looked like and where we should be strategically planting oysters. And again, that bill, I cut half of that bill through an amendment at the request of the watermen. It killed me inside to do that, but I also knew at the end of the day it was the right thing to do. And that's what bipartisanship means to me. I worked with my colleagues, my Republican colleagues on the Eastern Shore and across the state to get that bill across the finish line. I'm, I'm, I think it had a unanimous vote at the end of the day because we brought everybody to the table and it was a balanced, common sense, strategic approach to the issue. To answer the second part of the question, um, we're, we're unfortunately while we're doing well with oysters, we kind of kept our eye off the ball of crabs. And I know everybody's been seeing that prices have gone up. We have some pretty alarming two years in a row of, uh, of uh, data that tells us that we're, we're on the brink of a potential crisis here. So it's going to be a challenge. But before we do anything, we have to know where we are. We actually have to take a deeper dive into what's, what's going on. And so uh, I chair the Chesapeake Bay Commission this year, working with Re Republicans and Democrats in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, that Bay Commission work, we're actually pushing Maryland and Virginia and getting a partnership with NOAA to fund a crab survey, to listen to the experts, to literally bring those, them into the room so we can figure out and help answer the questions of what went wrong and what do we need to do and what are the proper interventions to get another one of our keystone species thriving again so that we can all enjoy it and we have a, a, a strong and healthy Chesapeake Bay. Stacy, do you want to respond to that? If you want to. No? Okay. Um, what I hear in both of your answers is we need more expertise, we need more knowledge. You said you would consult the experts, you said we need to do more studies. Uh, there are some big differences, but that is one bit of common ground that I think I hear in uh, both of your answers. Um, where, in the unlikely event, well, I say unlikely, but we're maybe headed into a recession, in the event that uh, we have to cut the state budget, where would you cut? an excellent question and again I serve on the budget committee so 90 days I spent pouring over budget books and taking the expertise of our wonderful nonpartisan council who give us cuts every single year and we go through those and, and weigh 
the services that will be cut if we cut that budget item, and we have made cuts over the years. There's not a lot of, I hate to say it, we've tried, I'll tell you, our best to find any fat or waste in the state budget, and we found some. I've passed a number of bills that have saved the state a couple million dollars here and a couple million dollars there, things that were just common sense and, and we were wasting money on. Um, so that's going to be a really tough one. Um, that's why it's important that we don't, while we have a, a, a good budget years, we're not spending ourselves back into the red. That we're making sure we're, we're strategically using some of that federal money that is more infrastructure and more capital money on one-time investments while we have it, but not in our operating budget that's going to get us into if God forbid we have a bad budget year, get us back into a structural deficit. That's gonna be uh, on my, my budget committee, that's my chief responsibility moving into the years ahead to make sure that we are spending wisely with an eye towards the fact that the economy is cyclical and we have to prepare for rainy days and we're gonna do just that. Well, where would you cut? Where would you cut? Big picture. I, this is a tough one because there's not a lot of waste or fat in the budget. Uh, 61 billion dollars where can we cut um, certainly not in the places that are uh, public safety um, we have to hold the line on that and we are facing um, some some deficits in our public safety personnel I've sponsored a lot of bills and supported a lot of bills to try to get the benefits packages and particularly pensions packages into a better place for, for public public safety uh, workers so I certainly would not touch that education I think is is uh, the silver bullet. I'm a proud product of public schools, and I think that's absolutely what, what we need to keep investing in. Environmental protections are incredibly important, particularly for this district. Matt, I'm struggling because this is a hard question. Um, I can only tell you that we have a lot of smart people whose jobs uh, it is to look for that potential fat, to look for that waste. And we've taken a lot of those cuts over the years, and I'm going to continue to lean on them and rely on them in my committee um, to make those tough decisions if we have to. <laughs> Stacey. Well, it's a pretty easy question. So uh, my opponent allowed a $17,000 pay raise for herself and the other legislators. Gone. That has to go. The Kerwan Commission, which I mentioned earlier, $3 billion a year, uh, no accountability. Spending like that has to go because there has to be some accountability for the spending, period. And um, I believe, and maybe it's from my life experience, um, and many of you have seen this, but we need to cut out things in the budget that may be sort of paybacks or bribes, essentially, um, which I believe happen, kickbacks. There needs to be somebody from the outside coming in like a business would or an accountant would in any public corporation and saying, hmm, it's funny that $18,000 per kid is being spent when we have crumbling buildings with no air conditioning. Where's that money going? Maybe we should look into that. So this sounds like a yeah. This sounds like a question you both have lots more opinions on. So please, and let me just come back. To 61 billion, and the tax revenues are going to be 58 billion in FY24. So you have to find three billion. No, they just were revised last week. Okay. Estimates. Okay, but in the in the event that eventually we will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we just uh, had another good budget revenue projection just last week. Uh, so we're going to be good for a couple more years, but always with an eye towards making sure we're fiscally responsible. Uh, maybe one place I would think to look towards, we just have not had a comprehensive review of our tax credits uh, across the board. Um, I wouldn't say there's, if, if there were if there were bribery or, or any, any misconduct, we, we would have found that. Um, but maybe they're not used as efficiently as they could have been um, and are not creating either the jobs that they said they would or, or et cetera. I think we need a comprehensive look at our tax credits and I think we could achieve some savings there. I do wanna address um, this odd number of $17,000. Uh, so Governor Hogan uh, constitutionally obligated every four years to put together a compensation commission for himself, for all of the constitutional officers and for the legislature. His commission voted after eight years of no pay increases for the legislature to give us a small 4% pay increase, graduated 2%, I believe 3%, 4%, that I think the 17,000 number accounts for all four of those years together. Um, I think that's what my opponent is referring to. Again, that was Governor Hogan's appointed commission that made that recommendation and also recommended, by the way, pay increases for the next governor and other constitutional officers. So um, I do not do this for the money. Um, I, I can assure you of that. You should see my car. Um, I do this because I have a heart for service and I love more than anything to solve problems. And I've been able to do that 
Um, I've been able to do that on, on my own tight budgets because uh, we have not gotten a pay increase despite what everybody else in this room has felt, uh, inflation and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but I've been able to make it work personally and I will continue to make it work for the state. How much does the state senator make? $51,000. 51,000, and that's for, it's not your job for you? Um, it, it is, it's intended to be a part-time job, I have to tell you, particularly since COVID, uh, our case management, folks who needed help in the district has certainly increased. I, I probably put 60 hours a week into this. I choose to make this almost a full-time job. I also teach, I teach at Towson University, my alma mater, um, uh, two, two classes a year, um, and I love to do that. I don't do that for the money either. Adjunct professors don't make that much money. Um, but uh, I, I choose to do it because I happen to love what I do. So, so thank you. To this question of the $17,000, um, uh, the, the, the raise. Yes. You want to speak to that? Well, Senator Alpha could have voted it down. Uh, they didn't. If you recall, four years ago, Governor Hogan actually slashed the pay of his state employees. So I think you guys should recall that um, this all could be taken out. And there's no reason anyone should be getting a raise when everybody else is not. Uh, I'm clearly not in it for the money. I spent more on the campaign than I'll make back in this. It is not supposed, nobody's supposed to be in it for the money. It is a job from January to the beginning of April. So it's the, most of the senators I know have a full-time job aside from this that pays most of their bills. It's not supposed to be that way. I know it's not a ton of money, but it's still, it's symbolically not the right thing to do to give yourself a raise when the rest of uh, the community is really suffering from inflation and cost of living uh, rising so much. Is your response? Um, the pay increase for everybody, governor, attorney general, legislators, didn't, didn't, it doesn't come up for a vote. If it had come up for a vote, I would have voted against it because it would have happened at a time when a lot of my constituents were also dealing with uh, budget cuts and also dealing with, in terms of seniors fixed incomes, I, I would have voted it down. I appreciate the raise, but it's not something that comes up for a vote. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what measures would you support or initiate to protect the Bay from climate change? and to protect uh, vulnerable communities from changes in the Bay's environment. Living on a peninsula here, in some cases, it's less than a mile wide. So we have water on three sides. Um, I think, uh, Stacy, you would go first on this. What measures would you support to, uh, or initiate, to protect the Bay from climate change? I know you guys are, some of you are con uh, concerned with the environment a lot, and I understand that. But I'm going to tell you right now, if some of you want the detailed answer to that question, I'm happy to research it, get you the exact answer you want. I'm not a scientist. I'm not here to examine the Bay or give you a scientific opinion, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to do that elsewhere. Um, and I'm happy to work with whoever becoming a senator that would inform me about the best ways to do that. Thank you. Um, I, I think the environment is why we all live here. Otherwise, we live in Oklahoma, which I made that joke once to somebody who was from Oklahoma, and I got in a lot of trouble. Um, but it, it's, it's truly why we all live here. It's an incredibly beautiful and sensitive and vulnerable place to live, particularly this district, because we are typically a district of, of peninsulas. I represent the Annapolis Neck, Mayo Peninsula, Shady's Ideal. Um, so it's a challenge. Now we've, at the legislative level, done a lot to uh, increase our, our use of renewable energy, to decrease our, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So long term, uh, we've done our part here in Maryland in a balanced way that creates well-paying jobs. But we also have to play defense because the seas are rising. And I live in downtown Annapolis. I can't get to my house a couple of days a year, and in 30 years, that's going to be more. Um, so it's very important that we protect what we have. So we, I've worked on, on legislation to create resilience authorities to tackle these infrastructure problems where we are most vulnerable, and, and that's being stood up at the county level and across the state. Charles County beat us to it because they have significant flooding issues as well. Uh, particularly when it comes to the fact that we've had two tornadoes and a king flood in this district in 18 months. Um, we are very vulnerable. Climate change is happening. Unfortunately, it's happening right here in District 30. When we had that tornado, we all went into response mode and we all tried to do our best for the folks and the small businesses that were impacted. Uh, government didn't always work best and we had a bill this last year to make sure that government worked faster when we have those micro storms, which we're going to see more and more. That tornado affected just Annapolis 
and Cecil County, but not the rest of the state. So we have to be more strategic about our response when natural disasters happen to our communities and be more nimble. And I'm actually working on a task force right now on a better statewide response for those micro storms. Um, the county executive mentioned before, I had a bill uh, just briefly, uh, the, the data we were using to determine our stormwater standards, as the councilwoman said, uh, was, was taken when I was in grade school. It's taken in the early 1990s. We don't have storms like that anymore. We have shorter storms, much more intensive storms that are overwhelming our stormwater systems. That didn't make any sense. So I reached across the aisle and brought a lot of folks with me because this is something that's impacting every single district in Maryland. We passed the bill to increase our stormwater standards based on the current data and then every five years thereafter so we don't find ourselves in this situation again. There's something that the senator did have some control over, which is the Chesapeake Bay Fund, which is the money in the legislature controls to use to, to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. And that money in the past has been raided at times to use for other things. And I would put a lockbox on that money to use it for the environment. That's really important. And that's where the legislature steps in. The scientific stuff can be discussed with experts, but that's where the legislature has control. And that's really what our legislature should be focusing on is making sure there's enough money in that to, to clean up the bay or to use for prevention. Uh, one of the other things that was discussed more by the county executives is the runoff into the bay in terms of development. Um, I've been fighting for years. I fought um, alongside actually Stuart Pittman to not have the Crownsville um, property up at the top of General's Highway get developed. A lot of that was for environmental reasons and runoff and different problems we've had for years. And I fought against traffic and overdevelopment for many, many, many years. I've heard the, the stories on 214 and the flooding. A lot of that has to do with environmental issues. A lot of it just has to do with day-to-day -day traffic. Ask yourself, is your traffic any better now than it was four years ago or is it worse? And a lot of that has to do with the lack of the state legislature doing something about roads like 214 and the runoff and the flooding. And nothing's been done in all this time by the state legislature. And you need to keep that in mind as well. I would love to let you respond and we're out of time. Okay? No, 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 sorry. Because um, uh, I have a better last question. Environmental reviews in all parts of MDE are taking an extremely long time. Uh, the uh, and services from the state to citizens are lacking in many ways. What would you do to shorten the turnaround time for these environmental reviews and to improve services to citizens? I think Stacy, you go first. What MD? Maryland Department of Environment. Again, this is not my purview. Um, this is really something in. Uh, in the purview of the legislature and actually the governor's office. So I would like to research it and get back to you. If you want a specific response on that, um, I'd have to study the office and I'll be honest about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sarah? Okay, sure. Great, sure. Uh, so this is one of those public safety issues, uh, Maryland Department of the Environment, because we've not had the inspectors to ensure that our drinking water is safe and we've not had the inspector, inspectors to ensure that our wastewater treatment plants are actually releasing clean water back into the bay. A lot of that has to do with staffing levels. Unfortunately, we have a very high vacancy rate at MDE. We've been trying at the legislative level to ensure that we, we decrease that vacancy rate so we're actually hiring more people. Again, this is a public safety matter to me um, that someone doesn't unfortunately you know, get harmed by, by uh, bad drinking water. So the legislature does have purview over MDE, and we've passed a number of bills these last few years to increase the level of inspections and inspectors, and really looking forward to filling those positions to make sure that we all feel more, feel more safe at the end of the day uh, drinking tap water. I agree, can I agree with my opponent? Um, that the, the, the Chesapeake Bay Fund should be lockboxed. It's never been rated in my time as your senator, and I can guarantee you, serving on the budget committee, um, I will not rate it, and I will fight every attempt to rate it moving forward because it is a priority for our Chesapeake Bay and our community. Great. Closing statements. You have two minutes. If you take less, that would be fabulous. <laughs> Sarah went first. Stacy, it's your turn to go first. I don't have much new to add, so um, I think you guys should just consider quality of life, and our quality of life has not necessarily gotten better in this area in the last four years. Traffic, think about that, hasn't gotten better. Flooding hasn't gotten better. 
cost of living surely hasn't gotten better it's gotten worse and you have to look to your local politician and stop looking to the national stage and look right here at home and say what can we do i don't think the current legislator or your current senator has done enough to make this area better when those things have gotten worse you've got to think about how much things cost you got to think about taxes you got to think about your schools you got to think about your roads you got to think about all of it and say has it gotten better and what's happened is as in the country our legislators gotten so polarized it used to meet in the middle it does not anymore it's gotten so left wing that you don't have a moderate middle and again hogan tried to do that 109 or 109 bills got rejected. That's not a middle. That's not bipartisan. We need that kind of leadership. We need some common sense in the legislature. You need somebody like me that'll not always vote with the party, that'll vote with common sense, that'll hear what you want me to vote for and do that for you. Thank you. Stacey McDonald. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I started by saying that I have the best job in the world because I get to help people and solve problems every single day. Um, and I've worked with many of you to solve those problems. One of the biggest problems we have here is, is Route 214. I'm grateful to the county for stepping up and putting forth the planning money because now it is a priority for the state. And serving on the budget committee, I get to ensure that that money stays there, not just for phase one, but for phase two and phase three, working with the community. And I will see you next week at the planning meeting at the, at the high school to do that. Those are the kind of deliverables that I can achieve for you as your senator. I've met in the middle. I voted against my party more so than almost every other Democratic senator, because sometimes the other party makes sense and my party's wrong. Um, we have gotten hyper-polarized in this nation and unfortunately in, in our community and, and sometimes at the state senate. But I have to tell you, we really do like each other in the state senate. 90% of our bills are unanimous, 95% are bipartisan, and I vote with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle more often than any other Demo most Democratic senators because this community demands of me to be more in the middle, to be more balanced and to deliver those results for you. I want to continue that work ethic. I want to continue that compromise, that consensus building that I've cultivated for four years, passing more bills than any other member of the General Assembly and all in a bipartisan way and delivering, uh, delivering uh, projects back to our district like 214 so that we can continue to have a wonderful place to live and thrive. So thank you all so very much for being here and I ask for your vote on November 8th. I hope this helps to clarify who you're going to vote for. These are four fabulous candidates. We have an incredible wealth uh, here on the Mayo Peninsula and in our district. So uh, many thanks to all four of you for being here tonight. It's been fabulous hearing from you, helping educate us, helping us make our own decisions. Many thanks to the blue shirts in the Mayo Peninsula. Yeah. Ken and Michelle. And Emily doesn't have her shirt on, but many thanks to Emily as well. So please, we're late getting out of here. Please help us put the chairs in the closet there and fold up the tables. And uh, you can visit with the candidates uh, in the foyer.